Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I'm of the stars. And I thought I'd talk a little bit today about good luck and bad luck in organizations and whether these assertions that people have about uh, some groups uh, practicing psi crime and that kind of thing, psychic crime, whether these assertions can be proven in the physical realm, in, in the law court. Uh, I do have a few things to say about this. Uh, f first, I'd like to say that in problems in one dimension must be solved in that dimension. So we can't anticipate uh, legal decisions in the physical realm regarding psychic reality. Uh, Rather, the place to address those issues is the psychic realm. Uh, so, so the sages, the great sages, the, the um, enlightened ones, the light workers, the, uh, and, and the way showers, and uh, the ascensioners, all the people that have the, the, um, a very positive attitude towards towards um, the evolution of humankind, they can make a great difference in the astral realm. And uh, mainly by passing through that realm and on to the, the fifth dimension, which uh, where the beings of light are, and higher, where the angelic realms are. Um, so, so they can bring in the light that will transform the reality, that will change the astral realm and the wildlife that's there. And that will affect the, the new sphere of the thoughts of the people. That's my first and greatest hope with regard to um, the, the, um, the astral plane. And greater than that is, is the light of God coming into earth, which is just a natural phenomenon in the will of God coming in. So. So, we have the light workers who wish to bring in, in God's grace. We have God himself who wish to, wishes to man, humankind to benefit from that grace. And we have the changing, change up that, that allows the light, to, ever greater light to be coming in. Uh, the great age of light that's dawning. Um, also, we have all the angelic beings, the beings of light, the, the wonderful beings that, that care for the natural order and for the universe who are, are, are happy to help us anytime we ask, along with God, along with Source. Okay, so we have all of these, these helping um, qualities of, of God's creation and, and we have God himself. Um, now, people talk about the karma of an organization and the luck of the people that are in it. And uh, the issue of the karma of an organization as a, as a, as a legal um, argument, I'd say, can't exist because above the law of karma that governs in, uh, the, the members of a group is the law of dharma, the law of grace, the law of the incoming light, and the law of God's love and light and joy. So the karma of a group and the karma of an individual, the karma of all life everywhere, the karma of the universe is an insignificant uh, factor uh, beside the the blessing of God, the Dharma. The Dharma. The Dharma does consist in living a good life. That's for for me, for a personal person. But Dharma transpires because I align my will with that of God. And, and I ask God for his blessing, you see. It's 
not because of what I do, but because of what God does in response to the asking. So Dharma's covers everything, everywhere, with love and light and joy, that I feel. So we can't speak of the karma of an organization in a legal sense as the thing that causes um, uh, psi crime events for, for individuals that they may target, were such to be true. There's a commonly accepted concept that some things are lucky and some things are not. And, and, I, and the question came up on the psychic plane just now, would it be possible to argue in a court of law in regard to an uh, organization, a group being lucky or unlucky, and to use that as a basis for um, a legal like effort with regard to psi crime? <laughs> and so this is quite an interesting question because people think of luck as something tangible and something real. And, and something, something like, you know, like a gold coin that you have, that's luck. <laughs> and in this regard, there is some truth, because the atmosphere of an organization or a group has to do with its beliefs. And the beliefs of the organization are like a giant group of thoughts. Big ones, small ones, big thought forms, small thought forms that adhere to the people and is an overall umbrella around all the people because of the teachings of the group. So each group has its own like cloud of thought forms no matter how geographically scattered it is. The Catholics have theirs, the um, Buddhists have theirs, the, um, the Islamic peoples have theirs, the Hindus have theirs, and then there are regional and intergroup differences. Okay. Now, thoughts or forms are very fluid. They flow around everywhere, and people who associate together in a group tend to exchange thought forms at a very fast clip and so that then the there's a sort of homo homogenous over umbrella of thought forms that everyone has okay and um, so the question is are these thought forms lucky or unlucky and is is like a physical sort of event that can cause people to um, to, to fall upon hard times, to experience bad things in life, and could this be pursued in a court of law, right? So, so my feeling about that is that we can judge an organization by its beliefs by first attempting to discover what God's will and what God's heart and what God's mind have in store as a, the skein of the universe. And then comparing God's plan with the plan of the group or organization. The farther God's plan is from that of the group of, or the organization, it seems to me, we could argue anywhere, that the less lucky its members will be because they will all be bathed in a relatively untrue uh, sea of thought forms. Um, could we take that to court? I don't think so. <laughs> but what we can do in a place like the United States is decide which groups we really want to belong to. Do we want to belong to what we perceive to be a lucky group or what we perceive to be an unlucky group, you know? Are the people in the group happy? Do they feel love? Do they feel joy? Or are they miserable for some reason? Are they unhappy? Are they grumpy? 
Are they sad? Are they angry? In preponderance, what is the tenor of the, th of the newosphere of the group, I'd say? And in that way, we can choose where we want to be. And then we can determine our own luck. So we have free will here in the United States. And I think in other countries, such as dictatorial countries or totalitarian countries, where it's impossible to choose the, the form of government, say, which is a, quite a large newospheric entity, then you may find that there is, uh, that there is bad luck for everyone and that they have to leave the country in order to, to experience good luck. Unless they're the type of person that flourishes in a government that has a relative lack of expression of free will. So now, on to the issue of mind control. People talk about being hapless victims of mind control and of groups that they say mind control. Is this really true or is it not? Because the pressure of thought forms in the world uh, is not subject to staying within a group or within a country or within a hemisphere at all. The pressure of thought forms flows th throughout the world all the time. It's always circulating throughout the world. It's one world, really, and one newospheric content. In this great newospheric, uh, like, climate of Earth, there are always thoughts of controlling other people. Now, we, we talk about, you know, grabbing someone and putting them in a room and locking them up and forcing them to be mind-controlled, you know. And that's kind of a special situation because their mind is constantly being targeted by unwholesome thoughts. Um, but in the world at large, there are many thoughts about thought control, about controlling other people. And, and how can we escape them then? Because we want to control our own lives too. We want to stay alive and so forth. We want to pursue our own happiness. So, so thoughts come to us of, of, of mind control because we want to control our own circumstances. The only way that I found to, to eliminate these mind control thoughts from my life is to be happy, to be joyful in the pursuit of this, my soul mission, my soul purpose. You know, if, if I'm pursuing it in such a way that I'm unhappy, then I need to switch tracks. And I'm talking immediately, not some other time. The minute that I do that, uh, everything changes and I no longer have those thoughts um, attracted to me that have to do with mind control. Control and joy are two exact opposites in the newospheric realm. Thoughts of joy do not attract thoughts of, of control, and thoughts of control don't bring happiness. So, emotional change, um, change of um, activities, or a change of just simply a change of, of emotion intentional change of emotion will change the newosphere just like that. One thing that it's important to keep in mind is that mind control experts, they're using the left side of their brain in order to influence what they consider to be the thoughts inside somebody else's brain. But that person has two hemispheres in their brain, left and right. That person has a lower mental body, a higher mental body, and a superconscious mind, all in the realm of the subtle body known as mind. Then it has other subtle bodies. The count of these varies. Some say seven, some say more. And in addition, you have the physical body, the physical body which has its own wants and needs and prerogatives. So the mind control expert may be spending his time with his left brain trying to influence one of the many m mental centers of another person, but leaving out, for instance, 
and most importantly, the body of light. The body of light which in, 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 through which all the other realms are, are influenced. The subtle bodies, each of which has its own manifestation in reality, and the joy of the cells of the physical body, none of which can be impinged upon through any method of mind control. So, so the notion that, that we can mind control other people has to do with a worldview that holds the higher mental body as the king of all the bodies that the soul manifests in an incarnation. Yeah, this is not so. It's a cooperation of physical body and subtle bodies that that creates uh, this, this hologrammatic experience for us. And it's also a cooperation of our um, soul with the uh, physical expressions of, and astral expressions of many other forms of life. We're like a tree of life here on Earth, we human beings. We have many, many microorganisms inside us that call us their home. We have many, many astral beings that help to form our many bodies and that, um, and that call our many bodies their home as well. So, so it's not just one person here with, say, a physical body and seven subtle bodies. No, it's a person with a physical body, seven subtle bodies, and trillions and trillions of beings, including, including all of the body cells, each of which has its own expression and purpose in this physical realm. So what will the mind control expert control in us? Which, which portion of us will it control? Will it control our, our left brain, our right brain, our gut brain, our superconscious mind? Will it control our astral expression, our, our emotions? Will it change our body of light? Will it inflict harm on our etheric templates? Will it cause a change in the Martian bacterial colonists of our large intestine? Will it change the health of our physical form? Can it influence the body cells of a particular organ or of all the organs? Can it change our soul mission or our soul purpose? What will be the intention of, of the mind controller? Because he is working with a, a causal network in the left brain, and yet our existence is a holistic experience of joyful expression of the lives of many beings. You know. Were he to attempt mind control in any arena of the mental field, we could always switch our awareness to one of these other realms of which we are the master, and so in that way evade his, his intention. Mastery of mind allows us to do that. So all effort ought to be bent, I feel, by the avid spiritual student on the issue of mastery of mind, mastery of one's personal mind, and not on the issue of whether someone else can control us. People talk about the controllers, and with a great deal of trepidation, they talk about the controllers of earth who are in charge of everything. And even the Bible talks about Satan. He says, uh, it says, Mammon owns the earth, are words to that effect, does it not? Earth is in the charge of Satan, it implies. But what does it mean by that? Does it mean that our soul experience in embodied form depends on what Satan manifests in the hologram around us? Or merely does it mean, and this I agree to, that Satan provides a hologram 
through which we can experience choices that allow us to grow in soul wisdom. This is what I feel the Bible really means when it says that mammon owns the earth. Mammon owns the hologram. Satan uh, is in charge of the duality play that allows us soul learning experiences. So people do talk about the controllers. I'd like to c call for a discussion of the controllers in the context of what they are unable to do. What can they do and what can they not do? My first guess would be that the controllers are unable to feel their hearts. And what do they lose by that? They lose uh, integration through joy and through love and through faith of their entire energy field. So in their attempt to control us, they lose control of themselves, you see. And, and in this way we can consider that the controllers are expressing a weakness that they have rather than a strength. Last night, or the night before, I had an interesting experience. Um, I've been listening to Judy Satori's www.judysatori.com, her um, her language of light offerings on uh, physical regeneration, and I was there's one that I listen to every day now, and uh, so I listened to it, and then I retired for the evening, and then things started happening in my energy field, in my body of light. And most amazing things, right? For instance, uh, like a t vortex of clearing energy came down from the sky down through my head and down into my um, into my neck. And then after the clearing process in my uh, from my head down, another clearing process started that was from mm, from the my lower quadrant of light up through my large intestine here and there. It was also a vortical clearing process. This type of vortical clearing um, is, I feel, less the product of language of light than the product of the ascension clearing process as a whole. It's one of the features of that process. It's what you might call an ascension symptom, but not really because it's an event that actually causes a clearing. So it seemed to me that my central vertical power current was getting a change up and that my body of light was clearing. But, and so I was not concerned about it. In fact, I felt pretty good about it. But but one of the qualities that it had was to remove all thought forms from my higher mental body and my lower mental body. Which can be frightening, I feel, if a person doesn't place their identity in their pure awareness rather than in their thought forms. And it does take some special experience in order for that understanding to take place. For instance, some people get it by fainting. They faint and their awareness is still hovering over their bodies. They can see their bodies, they can see their, um, the people around their bodies, and, but they realize that they are not their bodies, they're someplace else. Their awareness is the thing and not their, not their brain is the thing that they identify with after that. And in the same way, some people um, have near-death experiences and, and come to that conclusion. And uh, so, but the end, or it could be an operation. People have an operation, go under anesthesia, and from f a far corner of the room, they're observing everything that's going on. And then when they come back in body, after they are awakened from the anesthesia, they go, you know, there's more to, to existence than this physical form, for sure. 
You know, they go, awareness is the key. Nothing physical is, and the mind is not either, and the emotions are not it. It's a pure point of light within the mind of God that I am, they say, or something to, to that effect. A person can also get that kind of awareness of who they are through the vortical clearing process. The first time that it happens during the ascension process, they may say to themselves, Oh my Lord, I'm done for. I'm, I'm for sure dying now, right? And then they survive, and the next day they wake up and they say, No, that wasn't it, you know? I'm something beyond what my mind says. But, but a controller who, who, who watches, say, who has astral traveling ability or ubiquitous ability, omnipresent ability, for whatever reason, watches this process going on, will have a, an ideology, a concept, a set of notions about what is going on based on his um, desire to control other people. And so he may say, for instance, that he is causing the vortex to plague take place because he wants to place his mind inside of my mind. And this kind of astral chatter was going on the other night. I was hearing this chatter, but from prior experiences with point of light awareness, I knew it wasn't true. So I wasn't concerned about it. I was somewhat concerned by the followers of that person who were also gathered around and thought that he was doing that to me because I felt that they were misled by the concept that the group held. So then it got down to the vortical clearing motion that came up the torso from beneath the lower quadrant of, of the light body. And when that process was finished, they said, he has finished clearing her out, right? So then after that, I was in a state of very clear body of light. And, but I could feel his, because of his concept, he attempted to send his energy down through my central vertical power current. And when he did that, uh, what they call skinny dipping in some of the... Um, in some of the lore, the astral lore. When he did that, the Samskaras in his own um, etheric net uh, started making like astral chatter inside of my central vertical power current. And I, I did my best to explain to the group that was watching that, that those, uh, those talks that they heard, they had heard them with every clearing that he did. You know, so so it became clear to me that those those mischievous sayings, such as that I had cancer, or that, um, or that uh, it, uh, that a sexual event was occurring that he was doing to me, things of that nature. Um, those samskaras were most likely his own and that he was, because of the group's concept, uh, that he was doing like a master job of clearing in order to take over all kinds of bodies of light and stuff because he was like their guru. And that they would not stop him from flowing through the central vertical power current. They, they felt that he had no faults, you know, and so it had never occurred to them that it was his own samskaras that it was his own samskaras that he was infecting people with as he passed through in that skinny dipping uh, escapade that he did. So, um, so I tried to explain that, and I think I succeeded to some extent. I tried to explain to his followers, and I believe they're now going to work with him and attempt to uh, clarify his own body of light so that, uh, so that the work he does is not... Um, it doesn't present any difficulties for the people that he's attempting to heal. For ourselves, for the light workers, I say that such, should such an event occur, occur, there would be a reason for it. Um, that a clearing 
of the body of light has nevertheless taken place for us and that all we have to do is wait until the controller's unwanted presence is no longer within our energy field or to bid God send it away. And then uh, we will find that, that through God's grace our own um, body of light is renewed pristinely as it was before the pass-through, the flow-through, or the skinny dipping attempt. So, so that is the weakness of the controllers, the concept that they must control. There are even controllers that, um, that are, have decided that they need to be on top of everything, controlling everything with regard to the, to the ascension process. And so they and their group go up to the transpersonal chakras, to the eighth chakra, for instance, above the head, and insert thought forms above people's heads with the intention of being their teachers. The eighth chakra above our heads consists of the karmic metaprogram that allows us to change up the karmic play within our astral field uh, whenever we want to. So the presence of controllers as intruders there is, is, is an unwanted experience. There are various ways to clear this energy through God's help. The simplest in all instances being to align one's mind and heart and will with the great mind, the great heart, and the great will of God. And God will take care of everything for us. Another way to hold uh, such an event as I experienced a couple of nights ago is to consider the different qualities of the power of God in creation. Uh, these qualities are creation, sustaining the creation, and destroying the creation. So three, the power of Lord Brahma, the power of Lord Vishnu, and the power of Lord Shiva are all manifestations of the power of God in creation. The beings that were created by God naturally have a, a tendency towards or an affinity for one of those powers of God. There are beings that are intent upon the creative process. There are beings whose greatest desire is to preserve creation as it is. And there are beings whose greatest joy is the destruction of what has been created. Each of these beings has a purpose in God's plan, for creation cannot be constantly changing without the com constant implementation of each of these powers of God in many different uh, combinations. Well, so now, the controllers, it seems to me the controllers would favor, first of all, Lord Vishnu, the preserver of things as they are, because in the current context of the duality play, the controllers can preserve the illusion that they are in control of others. Those controllers who know that things are changing, that the ascension process is creating change on Earth, for instance, may wish to shift to uh, the energies of Lord Shiva, utilized against the light workers and the ascensioneers and those who are enlightened because they may feel 
that those other beings are creating the new. For those of us who hold the energy of creating the new here on earth, the energy, the Lord Shiva energy of the destroyers is very important because first of all it balances the dark against the light as the change-up process, the stepping up of the light occurs. Always as the light steps up, the dark steps in to create a balance between dark and light. It might seem like a dark attack, but actually it's just a leveling up of the dark and the light. Um, always as the light workers bring in light and grace and love, the dark steps up to the plate with a renewed kind of darkness and controllers will step in and and attempt to stop the light workers from doing their work. In fact, it could be that for every light worker on earth there's a dark worker who worships Lord Shiva who's assigned by God to to plague that person because in that way the balance of the stepping up of the light, the process can occur uh, flawlessly and with least trouble for everyone. So, so we light workers can appreciate the importance of the dark. We can appreciate the importance of the controllers and we can appreciate the importance of those who worship Lord Shiva in this, this beautiful light show that's taking place here on Earth right now.